<laughs> so polite. I love that song. <laughs> Casting crowns. I used to listen to that over and over again. I tell you, it's so true. Um, so easy to uh, to dismiss all the blessings, but, but the moment the storm comes, right? You're, you're always questioning. You're always looking and like, why? Why, God? You know? So today, we're kind of on that same thought a little bit. Um, we're going to be uh, over in Exodus chapter 3. And, uh, I'm sorry, the mic on. Can y'all hear me? Yes. There we go. It was not on. So. Yep. So, yeah, we're going to be talking about uh, <clears throat> Moses today. And, you know, this is really, maybe next month we'll talk about Pharaoh. Um, but... Uh, I want to talk about the subject of stubbornness today. And everybody gets this vivid picture of Pharaoh chasing the Israelites across the, the desert, right? <clears throat> Coming up to the, the water and, and Moses, you know, trusting God, lifting the water, and the Israelites making it through on dry ground. And then Pharaoh in his extreme stubbornness. It's like, let's go. You know, I, I know that God, you've told me once, twice, thrice, ten times, and you've done these miraculous things. And, you know, he's seen everything. And I say, well, I say that. He's seen a small dose of what God can do. And yet, still, in his extreme stubbornness, he wasn't willing to let go. And he's like, I want him back. And. <laughs> Hence the title of the message, right? Maybe the title of, of next month when we go over Pharaoh. But don't let the water crash on you. <laughs> because he came across that probably at that point thinking, hey, starting off as like, who is this God, right? You know, I'm Pharaoh. I, I am ruler of the known civilization. I'm the biggest guy here. Who is this God to come up and say that to me? And he soon finds out in that stubborn fit to go back and, and boom, the water comes down on him. You know, we're going to, 1 Samuel 15, 23 says, For rebellion is as, as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity. Wickedness and idolatry, because thou, <clears throat> because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he has also, also excuse me, rejected thee from being king. This was a moment when Prophet Samuel told the King Saul here, he said, you know, obedience is better than sacrifice. And Saul was worried about looking good in front of the people. And he said, hey, I've done all this so we can sacrifice these animals. I've kept all these from uh, when he went in, he destroyed the kingdom, and he, he took all these animals, and he said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sacrifice them to God. I'm going to keep these and, and Samuel tells him the ramifications of what his stubborn act was, right? And, and look at this on the screen. You know, he said, stubbornness is as iniquity. And he's saying it's wicked. It's unjust before God. And idolatry. Loving, respecting, reverencing something more than God. When you're stubborn, you love something else more than God. Deep down, whether you admit it or not, because King Saul was not about to admit that, right? When you're stubborn, you love something else more than God. You're committing the sin of idolatry. And, you know, we looked at Pharaoh and we talked about him just briefly, but I want to focus on the other guy in the story. And we're going to focus on Moses today. So Exodus, actually let's read, uh, I've got it on the screen here. Exodus chapter 1, 6 through 13. You may want to turn there because the font's not very big up here. So getting a, we're going we're gonna to get the backstory. But it says, And Joseph died in all his brethren and all that generation. Everybody remember Joseph? You know, the guy number two in Egypt. He brought all Israel over there, you know, saved them from the famine. And it said, And the children of Israel were fruitful and increased abundantly and multiplied and waxed exceeding mighty. And the land was filled with them. Now there arose up a new king over Egypt, 
which knew not Joseph. And he said unto his people, Behold, the people of the children of Israel are more and mightier than we. Come on, let us deal wisely with them, lest they multiply. And it come to pass, that when there falleth out any war, they join also unto our enemies and fight against us. And so get them up out of the land. Therefore they did set over them taskmasters to afflict them with their burdens, and they built for Pharaoh treasure cities, Pithom and Ramses. But the more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied and grew. And they were grieved because of the children of Israel. And the Egyptians made the children of Israel to serve with rigor. We've got a time here when they were worried about Israel taking over Egypt. Israel had come over, they were multiplied. <laughs> it even goes on, you know, in, the, in verse 15, we won't read that, but it even goes on and says that, you know, they commanded the Hebrew midwives to kill any sons that they bore. So they, any, any sons that the Hebrew women bore, they said, hey, you're the midwives, you need to kill them, right? You need to take them out and kill them upon birth. That was abortion before abortion, right? It's a good thing they didn't have ultrasounds back then. So that's the thing. They were like, we were worried about them multiplying and taking over. And so we fast forward through that. We've got Moses, you know, we won't get into his story, miraculously makes it through this period. You know, he grows up in the, in the court there of Pharaoh. And Josiah brought this up. Thank you, Joe. We're going to read in Exodus 3, 4 through 10. And God confronts Moses right here. Let's read this about his children, Israel. And when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, and God called unto him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here am I. And he said, Draw not nigh hither. Put off thy shoes from off thy feet, for the place wherein thou standest is holy ground. Moreover, he said, I am the God of thy father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people which are in Egypt, and have heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. And I am come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians, and to bring them up out of the land unto a good land, and a large, unto a land flowing with milk and honey, unto the place of the Canaanites, and the Hittites, and the Amorites, and the Parasites, and the Hivites, and the Jebusites. Now therefore, behold, the cry of the children of Israel has come unto me, and I have also seen the oppression wherewith the Egyptians oppress them. Come now therefore, and I will send thee unto Pharaoh, that thou mayest bring forth my children, <coughs> excuse me, bring forth my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. So, Here's where we get into the message part. We all think of Pharaoh and his extreme stubbornness, but we forget that Moses had a streak of stubbornness as well. And I think a lot of times we, we think, boy, I could never be so stubborn to have these ten plagues leading up to the death of, you know, no telling how many children. You know, you know, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. I would never get to that point at Pharaoh. It's like, you think one, you know, maybe two Ah, three, four, but to make it all the way through ten plagues and then die by chasing them, trying to get them back. But a lot of times we don't look, a lot of times we are in Moses' shoes here. Where God tells us something he wants us to do. He gives us a plan. And that's the first question today I've got to ask. And I ask this for all of us. What is God asking you to do? And I think the big part of our stubbornness a lot of times is we don't listen. I know I struggle with this sometimes, but a lot of times if I were to ask, what does God want you to do? You might be like, well, you know, be a good person. You know, <laughs> do what? You know, are you listening to God? Are you asking? You know, I think uh, in life, each day, there are no age requirements to this. God has a plan for you. God has a purpose for you. And I think without acknowledging that, I think we just tend to get into this, this little cycle of life. And it's easy to do. Monday, what do you do? You go to work. Tuesday, you go to work. You know, for right now, it's then we go home and we go to ball. <laughs> and then Tuesday, we go home and we go to ball. And then Wednesday, we go to work. And then Thursday, we go to work, we go home, we go to ball. 
you know, and then Friday, you know, you get, and, and you get into this cycle and you forget the main purpose. Like, what is God trying to ask of me? Because God wants to work within your life. He don't want to be an outside part. He don't want to be, you know, 30 minutes in the morning in the Bible or five minutes or whatever time. He don't want to be a little prayer over your meal, you know, before breakfast, lunch, and supper. Maybe you pray over your snacks. I don't know. But he doesn't want to just be there. He wants to be an influence in your life in each and every action that you do. And so we've got to ask, what is God asking us to do? And at this point, God was asking Moses to be the voice piece, right? To be the leader, to lead his people out of Israel. And, and so to understand, you know, that fear can be a mask for stubbornness. That fear that Moses is about to betray can be a mask of stubbornness. So let's, let's read on. Let's read uh, Moses' answer here. 13 through 17 says, And Moses said unto God, Who am I that I should go unto Pharaoh, and that I should bring forth the children of Israel out of Egypt? And he said, Certainly I will be with thee. This is God speaking, right? And this shall be a token unto thee, that I have sent thee. When thou hast brought forth the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God upon this mountain. And Moses said unto God, Behold, when I come unto the children of Israel, and shall say unto them, The God of your fathers has sent me unto you, and they shall say to me, What's his name? What shall I say unto them? So, so we got Moses asking this question, right? And he said, Okay. They're going to say, Who are you? Well, first he says, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh, the most powerful on the planet? And then they're going to ask, who are you, right? And I think we've got to identify this first part. Let's continue on here. What are your what ifs? In stubbornness, stubbornness there's always what ifs. There's always something in your life that God will ask you to do something. And then you're like, what if? What if they say this? You know, so the first thing Moses was like, well, God, I'm not qualified. Right? Who am I to go to Pharaoh? You know, God, you should go yourself. Pick out somebody better than me. You know? And then he's like, what if this happens? And what if that happens? What will Pharaoh think? What will the people of Israel think? You know, I, I've not been there and been enslaved like them. You know, you ever had somebody come? It's called the Savior Complex, right? You know, and say, let me, let me save you. I've not done this. I've not walked in their shoes. What are they going to say? And God's addressing these, but, but he forgot one simple thing. I, I remember, and I'll say this, who, who knows who John MacArthur is? Anybody heard his name? Okay, so, so I have nothing negative or positive to say, but it's, in this case, you know, he was asked, who, who knows who Stephen Furtick is? Yeah. So he, he's a preacher on that. So. And it's funny because I, I've listened, listened to both of them. And one's a more traditional and one's, one's a little bit more, I'm going to call the, the, hip, the hip preacher. You know, a little bit more hip. Dresses a little bit more hip. And, uh, but now, whatever you believe, I, I've never heard anything that, that's, you know, what I would say uh, doctrinally wrong in the sense of salvation. And they were asking John, you know, and they said, uh, what do you think of so-and-so, this guy? Stephen Furtick, yeah. and give me a one-word answer. And, you know, and this is not to bound John, because I think we've, we've been this way with other people. And he just brought up unqualified. And, and you know, I thought about that, and, and I watched uh, Stephen's interview on that, and he said, you know, I was, I was waiting to see what he would say about this. And, you know, and, I, and then, I, then I saw kind of the look on his face, and you could see, it's like, that's not going to be positive, <laughs> you know what he said. And he, and he looked at it and he said, when he said unqualified, he's like, kind of, kind of heart fell a little bit. And he said, you know, this guy that I've respected and admired, and he's just looking at me and he's like, I'm not qualified. But lucky for Stephen Burdick, John MacArthur don't qualify people. Right? You know, and he, he wrote a book and he said, you know, he actually wrote a book about it. It's kind of funny. He wrote a book named Unqualified. But at the end of the day, you're never unqualified when you're called by God. Because God does the qualifying. Not men, not your peers, not anybody around you. God qualifies you. 
And, you know, he, he said, Stephen said, you know, hey, he's right, I'm not qualified. Because really none of us are qualified to serve God. Not in our own nature. It's God that qualifies us, right? None of us are making, it, making our way to heaven by our deeds. None of us are making it to heaven by what we do. You know, I listened to a guy the other day, and his, his wife died uh, a year ago, and uh, and he just said, hey, you know, I, I just hope she, she wrote this, and he, he termed a religious book. And uh, I was listening to him kind of pour out his heart. And it's like, you know, she died. He found out, and I can't even remember the name of the, the disease, but it was like 40 days. Found out she was sick, and, and boom. All of a sudden paralyzed, couldn't walk in Vanderbilt for 40 days, and then she passed away. And uh, he's like, I just hope she's always been a, you know, believer. He said, I just hope, I just hope that, you know, I'm good enough to join her there one day. And, and you know, I was listening to it, and it's kind of kind of sad because I was, I was broken up. And, you know, and I was like, Lord, what do you want me to say? Because I don't, I don't know. And I just said, you know, sir, it's, it's, let me tell you. And I, and I think your wife would be there. I said, it's not about what we do. It's about who we trust in. Because I said, you can't do enough good. Jesus already did the good, right? He already offered us. It's God that does the qualifying. And when you approach him and you say, what if, what if, what if, you're betraying a trait of stubbornness. You're masking that fear with stubbornness because you think of yourself by your own power. Not with God's power. What are your what ifs? Moving on. Here we read in verse 14 through 17. And God said unto Moses. Listen to this. I am that I am. Moses, you're focusing on the wrong thing. Right? You're worried about Pharaoh. You're worried about Israel. I'm here in a burning bush telling you what to do. You know? Listen. I am that person. You know, you should listen to me. And he said, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am hath sent me. And God said, Moreover unto Moses, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, The Lord God of your fathers. You know Abraham? You know Isaac? You know Jacob? I'm that God. Right? I'm that person. I'm that God. This is my name forever. And this is my memorial unto all generations. Go and gather the elders of Israel together and say unto them, The Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob, appeared unto me, saying, I have surely visited you and seen that which is done to you in Egypt. And I have said, I will bring you up out of the affliction of Egypt unto the land of Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Parasites and the Hivites and the Jebusites unto a land flowing with milk and honey. Do you believe God has better things for you? I think this is the third thing when we're talking about stubbornness. Do you truly believe that God knows better than you? Yes. Good job. Yeah. Carter does. So, so many times we mask, you know, this, this reticence in our life because we just truly don't believe God knows better than us. God was like, Moses, go save Israel. Go, go, go tell Pharaoh, let my people go. That's where they get, right? Let my people go. And, and Moses said, well, God, what if Israel doesn't, you know, believe me? What if Pharaoh says no? Who am I to say that? In the end, he was thinking, well, you know, God, you hadn't thought of this. You hadn't thought of this. You hadn't thought this through. What's going to happen when that happens? And, you know, he truly did not believe that God knew better than he did. He did not believe that God had better things in mind than he did. Do you believe God cares? Do you believe God knows best? Are we trusting, right? I think one key component of that is, are we noticing the blessings that we already have? Have you looked around? When you're in, when you're in the burning bush, when you're thinking what a wreck your life is, have you looked around and noticed the blessings that you already have been blessed with? I'm way better when I'm low to sit there and think about what good I have. A lot of people just want to focus on the bad, the bad, the bad. Hey, you're just going to go lower and lower and lower and lower. 
Sit there and think about what God has blessed you. Exodus 3, 18 through 20. And they shall hearken to thy voice, and thou shalt come. So this is God again telling them. Thou and the elders of Israel unto the king of Egypt, and ye shall say unto him. So he's giving them advice. He's saying, okay, listen. They're going to listen to you. You're going to take the elders of Israel. Listen to this, listen to this request. This, this is interesting. And ye shall say unto him, The Lord God of the Hebrews hath met with us. And now let us go, we beseech thee, three days' journey into the wilderness, that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God. And I am sure that the king of Egypt will not let you go. No, not by a mighty hand. And I will stretch out my hand and smite Egypt with all my wonders, which I will do in the midst thereof. And after that, he will let you go. Now this, this is the abbreviated version, right, of what happens. But God foresees Pharaoh's stubbornness. God knows what Pharaoh's going to say. And it's funny because the only request, like, he didn't actually say, let my people go. He's like, hey, let us just go out and make sacrifices to our Lord. And, and it's funny, as we, as we see right here, let's read on. And Moses answered and said, but behold, they will not believe me. Now, this is funny. God says, go request. This is what's going to happen. And then I'm going to do this. What does Moses say? But behold, they will not believe me. Nor hearken unto my voice. He's still in Moses' talk. He's still like, listen, this is Moses. They're not going to listen to me, God. What did God say earlier? Did he say, go tell them I'm Moses, listen to me? No, he said, I am that I am. Nor hearken unto my voice, for they will say, The Lord hath not appeared unto thee. And the Lord said unto him, What is in thine hand? And he said, A rod. And he said, Cast it on the ground. And he cast it on the ground, and it became a serpent. And Moses fled from before it. And the Lord said unto Moses, Put forth thine hand, and take it by the tail. And he put forth his hand, and caught it. And it became a rod in his hand. That they may believe that the Lord God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, hath appeared unto thee. And the Lord said, Furthermore unto him, Put now thine hand into, into thy bosom. And he put his hand into his bosom, and when he took it out, behold, his hand was as leprous as snow. And he said, Put thine hand into thy bosom again. And he put his hand into his bosom again and plucked it out of his bosom. And behold, it was turned again as his other flesh. And so he gives them this sign here, and you can read on down, and we won't do that. But he gives them this sign, and he says, you know, Cast the rod on the ground. It's kind of funny. It's almost, if you think about it, he cast it on the ground, it turns into a snake, and Moses starts running away. <laughs> it's like, wow, you know. And then this guy's like, grab it by the tail, and he picks it up, and it turns into his rod again. And then he's like, put your hand in your jacket, you know, on your bosom, and it comes out, and it's leprous. And then, you know, he's like, stick it back in, and, and boom, it's healed. And God's showing him, like in our life, it's kind of like a flashback, and it's like, when you're questioning God, and you're like, they won't believe me, they won't do this, you know, you ever think, and God shows you something that he's done in your past, and it's like, I've brought you through this, I've done this for you, I've done this. This is a small task I'm asking of you, you know. And Moses still is just too stubborn. He's like, no, God, they're not going to listen to me. They're not going to understand me, you know. And then he then he takes them, and, and you see in verse 9, it says, hey, um, you know, here's two signs, neither hearken unto thy voice, that thou shalt take up the water of the river and pour it upon dry land, and the water which thou takest out of the river shall become blood. So he, he turns, you know, water into blood on dry land. And, and so he kind of answers Moses' reticence here, and Moses is like, okay, well, that's true, God. You have a lot of power. You know, you, you, you are capable of this. Like he gives in. You know, one, one part cracks, but then what, what else happens here, right? says, but Lord, I can't speak well enough. I'm just not eloquent. You know, I can't, I can't talk well enough. You know, the Lord ever impressed on you to say something? You're like, but what if it comes out wrong, right? Ever impressed up on you to, to sing something? Well, Lord, I can't sing well enough. Or I get nervous in front of people. Or he's impressed on you to witness to someone. And it's like, but Lord, you know, you know, it's, it's kind of weird and awkward. And I'll, I'll push them away and I'll force them away. So many things that the Lord asks you to do. And what are the excuses that you're given? What are the excuses that you're given? And this is this is not even what if anymore. This is like, Lord, you know, 
this will happen. You know, it's not what if, this will happen. He said, I am not eloquent, neither heretofore, nor since thou hast spoken unto thy servant. I'm slow of speech and of slow tongue. And the Lord, you can sense his frustration here. You know, I've showed you everything. And you're, you're talking about your mouth and the words that are coming out of your mouth? What's the question? Who made your mouth? That, that, Sean, what would that be called? It's almost like roasted, right? I, I hear that all the time with the boys whenever you say something. Like, roasted. Roasted, you know. <laughs> it's like, that's the ultimate roast from God, right? You know. It's like, who made your mouth, right? <laughs> who, who gave you words to talk with? Who, who allowed you to speak? Who maketh the dumb, the deaf, the seeing, the blind? Have not I the Lord? Now therefore go, and I will be thy mouth, and teach thee what thou shalt say. And he said, O my Lord, send, I pray thee, by the hand of whom thou wilt send. And, and again, it's, it's about to blow over. It's about, about a moment where the water's going to come crashing down on Moses any minute. He's about to be in Pharaoh's predicament because he's about to push God too far. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses. And he said, Is not Aaron the Levite thy brother? I know that he can speak well. And also, behold, he cometh forth to meet thee, and when he seeth thee, he will be glad in his heart. And thou shalt speak unto him, and put words in his mouth, and I will be with thy mouth, and with his mouth, and will teach you what ye shall do. And he shall be thy spokesman unto the people, and he shall be, even he shall be to thee instead of a mouth, and thou shalt be to him instead of a God. And thou shalt take this rod in thy hand, wherewith thou shalt do signs. So, he gives them a task. Right? He offers all these what ifs. He said, you know, not have the power. I'm not qualified. They're not going to listen to me. He gives them a rod. It's a rod that was also in the Ark of the Covenant, right? Moses' is rod. It turns into a snake and powers. And so you've got to ask that personal question. Today, what are your excuses for not being willing? And you see later on his what ifs, because they always do, will turn into this will and I can't statements. Because you build and you build and you build upon that stubbornness until at the point where you're just ignoring what he's saying to you. And the thing in the end, and we read this, you know, and Moses had this problem. What are you excusing instead of utilizing? So God met Moses' objections with, hey, you have the power, and he scared him with a snake. Moses said, I can't speak well. Well, we both know Aaron, right? He's a good speaker. Take him. If you don't trust me enough, I'm going to utilize somebody that's there. Utilize me. Utilize Aaron. And I think in this particular instance, you know, God will always, and I say in this particular instance, in every instance, God will always provide you what you need. When's the last time that we've looked at our life and said, hey, what does God want me to do? Seriously. Like, what does God want me to do? What is he asking of me? And then, what are your excuses for not doing it? And that brings you to the trust aspect. Of why are you not doing it? I, I look, and Dad brought up, and, and you know, there has been a lot of help in this church. There's been a lot of, we've done a lot of great things together. You know, that, that one person can't possibly do, right? And as a body, the ultimate example of, of this is the church. Like the ultimate example, when God says, put on the whole armor of God, he's armed you with his word, he's armed you with prayer, you know, he's armed us with each other. That, you know, in Moses' situation, he had Aaron, right? And he would have never been able to do that, probably without Aaron, to some degree. But God, well, I say that, God could have still utilized him, right? He still could have done it without Moses or Aaron. But Moses, you know, had that request and God honored it. And I, I find that, Oh, that kind of interesting because at first he was like, Moses, go do it. I'll be the mouthpiece, right? But then 
Moses had this abnormal request. And it's like, hey, almost like his safety blanket, Aaron. And God had the mercy to give that to him. And so today, what are you excusing instead of utilizing? Otherwise, <laughs> it's funny. Otherwise, we'll be like a pharaoh. You know, the story of Gideon tells it all. Because uh, I think in this point, a lot of times we're just guilty of not utilizing God. A lot of times when it comes down to it, we're guilty of not utilizing God. Uh, was it 32,000 men that Gideon started out with? 32, right? And it whittled down to 10. And it whittled down to 300. And, you know, when God says his strength is made perfect in our weakness, it's not talking about us being, you know, just mild and meek and all that. It's to talk about totally, total trust in what he can do. Total willingness to step aside in something that you're not comfortable with and to, and to do that action with which you're not comfortable with. And Moses clearly was not comfortable. I don't think any of us would be comfortable marching into uh, Nero, right? And saying, hey, you should be a Christian. And that was likened to Moses walking into Pharaoh and said, you need to let the biggest part of your workforce go. You know, you imagine that wasn't a popular consensus with, uh, with the Egyptians, right? <laughs> and like all these guys that are managing our flocks, all these guys that are managing, you need to let them go. Let them go. And Moses understood the gravitas of that statement. And that's why he was the first stubborn person. And maybe next month we'll talk about Pharaoh's situation as well. But that is it for me. I appreciate everybody. I went a little bit longer than I would like to. But remember, we do have nursing home today at 115.